Something to Talk About is a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday program at the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. And we meet at 11.30 on Zoom. And pretty soon, I'll bet we'll be meeting in person uh, as well. And today, we're going to be talking about gardening with Ann Lovejoy. And Ann also uh, has regular get-togethers here at the center on the last Tuesday of the month. Uh, from 10 to noon. And if it's pleasant outside, you can go outside and look at the garden. And if it isn't, you can come inside and I hope pretty soon have a cup of tea while you talk about gardening. Uh, something to talk about is sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care of Bainbridge Island. And they offer innovative and compassionate care on Rolling Bay. And they are now accepting residents. If you'd like to schedule a, schedule a tour of Fieldstone's beautifully appointed apartments, call them. 360-271-2530. That's 360-271-2530. And Anne, thanks once again for joining us. It's always a great visit with you once a month well, for this thanks. topic. Yeah, it's always fun for me too. And I can't wait to get back to in person. Um, and you're right, we can do the end of the month ones. The last Tuesday, hey Megan, the last Tuesday of each month we can start doing in person in inclement weather um, and that'll be great too because I love seeing your faces. I'm hoping that you have lots of questions for me. I did want to just start out by reminding everybody that with all the rain we've had the soil is extremely fragile. It's soaked and waterlogged and every time you step your entire weight is transferred to the amount of space your one footprint takes up. So some of us are putting a considerable amount of weight on that soil, plunk, plunk, right? And it compresses it and it can take months to decompress. So if you have to walk into the borders or the beds or the vegetable garden, use a little piece of um, two by four, not, I mean, not two by four, but a piece of wood of some kind, like a plank or um, a little piece of plywood or something like that to distribute your weight, your weight more evenly. Uh, and really, you know, by now there's probably not a huge amount of reasons to do that, but if you do have to, Again, just remember that the compression of that soil is, is really a problem for your plants. It can lead to root ruts and uh, a lot of pathogens building up in the soil. So walk softly and stay out of the garden as much as you possibly can. Um, and I hope that makes sense. Because again, the compression of your footprint is considerable. And that, uh, <laughs> that has its long lasting effects. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, that's uh, that's something I wouldn't have thought of really, you know, because you just walk, but and and you can go in there when the when the ground is drier without sure. consequence. Well, not necessarily without consequence, because even especially after the winter, the whole soil is very open because it's had this wonderful rest period, and you, hopefully, it's got a lovely blanket of compost and fallen leaves and things like that. So it's at its most open. So at that point too, it's pretty vulnerable and you wanna really think about where your feet are. Um, and one thing you can do is put some stepping stones into gardens where there's places that you often have to go in and do something. Maybe put a couple of those uh, concrete squares or blocks or rounds so that you can have a place to land and then maybe that place gets compressed, but it doesn't get all over the place. Does that make sense? Wow. Just minimize it a little, right? So I still have some planting left to do. <laughs> this is Francine. Is it, yes. Is it possible? It is. But what, like maybe get a piece of plywood, like I was saying, or use one of those yeah. rubber kneelers and use that. But even the rubber kneelers, they do compress quite a bit. So it's good to have like a, maybe a little board underneath that and then put your kneeler on it for your comfort. And remember for the comfort of your soil and your plants, you wanna kind of distribute your weight much more evenly. And this is actually a great time to plant. And Reed is right in that a couple days without pouring rain will help the soil set up a little better. Um, but it, it's just from now till really the middle of February, this is the time to be pretty careful and thoughtful about walking around in your beds and borders. Okay, great. I was gone this whole rainstorm. I was down in California where it was 90 degrees. So yeah, different <laughs> I came story. home. Yeah, I came home and I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> well, my rain gauge, which goes to seven inches, ran over several times in the last few weeks. So Wow. We've had a lot of rain and the wind didn't help. And one of the things a lot of people are saying is there's a lot of blowdown and all these big 
chunky branches that come down, some of them can be reused really nicely for protecting newer plants. Like if you're planting stuff that is like perennials or young trees or shrubs, um, and they might be somewhat susceptible to frost damage, you wanna just loosely pile, not the big heavy giant branches, but cut off some of the smaller side branches and loosely put them around. And that will capture about two or three degrees of frost, sometimes a little more, um, which oh, can wow. protect. Yeah, it gives a little protection to those young, the plants that are trying to do get their roots established. This is the time of year when they do a lot of root growth. So that's on your side. If anybody right. accidentally digs up a bulb they planted a month ago, you'll find, you know, when you're thinking of a good place to put something and it doesn't look like there's anything there. So you dig it up and discover that that's where you put the tulips. Um, <laughs> you'll see they have a good fringe of roots on them already. Just this last month has been very conducive to root growth, if nothing else. And I have two questions that I've been mulling over. One is that um, yesterday I was talking to my next door neighbor and he lives, we both live in the woods. He, he has a lot of trees closer to his house than we do, but he's, he's afraid of fire that, that what, what should I do to protect my house? Or is there any kind of cover crop or plant that can be a good buffer? There are actually good, um, there are some fireproof or fire resistant plants and there are plants that are much more susceptible and there are extensive lists on them um, through the Department of Natural Resources um, and also um, the, uh, what's Hillary, the chairperson of, I mean, the commissioner. Department of, of yeah, isn't that the DNR? Department, or is it the natural lands? I mean, there's several different websites, but they have a lot of that material, but it's mostly designed for the east side because that's where traditionally the fire hazard has been highest. But you can look on those lists and see things like, oh, rosemary, super high in essential oil, probably not good to have it right beside your house mm. um, because it can. those plants that are high in essential oils can actually ignite just by heat. They don't need the actual presence of the flame. If the fire is approaching your house, gets hot enough, some of those plants will spontaneously ignite. Very exciting. Wow. Lori yeah. Franz is the Commissioner of Public Lands. That's it. Thank you. I wasn't getting it quite. Um, but so she's made, uh, there are, she's had some programs developed that will, that are guidelines for how to keep your home safer in, in wildlife situations and fire, wild, wildfire situations. Now, right now, the risk is practically zero. I mean, everything's wet, 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 finally. So, but to think ahead for next year, one of the things they suggest is uh, to really look through the wooded areas around you and look at what's on the ground. And if there's a lot of old dried out branches, those might be better used in a, like keep them in a, a um, an area that's not too close to your house. They make a wonderful wildlife refuge. You'll get all kinds of critters loving to live in a pile like that, but you don't want it really quite right near your house. But you also don't want to take everything out of the forest environment because that's robbing all the nutrients, right, that, yeah. that are needed. Um, there, some of the ground covers that, that are natural to this area are more fire resistant. Um, Salal, for instance, is not a uh, a quick to ignite plant. Um, but And that's certainly a native ground cover that once you got it, you got it, right? <laughs> but thinking about keeping some space around your house, I, when I used to do a lot of garden designs, I would always talk to people about designing like a green, a golden bowl so that your home is in the center and then all the daylight can reach you because there's a sort of shallow area around the house and then the rising edges of trees and shrubs. And if you think of it that way, instead of <coughs> cramming your house with trees and shrubs right next to it, um, that will give you that safe space also. And one of the things people are, are starting to really learn more about is some of the back burning techniques that were developed first by First Nations people a long time ago who knew that to protect some of their areas, they could back burn open areas, meadows, fields. And that meant when the fire got to that place, there was no more fuel for it at that point and it would move somewhere else. Um, and our, many of our lots are not really big enough to give you a huge, um, a huge amount of free space, but it is something to really think about that when you put a lot of plants, especially trees and shrubs or brittle things or things that are high essential oil content close to your house, that is not a safe practice. And anymore, we do have to think about that. Good question. 
Thanks. The other thing, of course, is limbing trees, causing them to be limbed by a, an arborist, not just somebody with a chainsaw, but trees that touch any part of your home or garage or outbuildings, the skirt should be lifted so that the branches are up above that and are not on the roof, on the gutters. Um, for one thing, that creates a moisture pocket where rot and mildew and mosses can start to build up. But for another thing, um, you want that free air passage to keep everything nice and dry and to eliminate the possibility, well, to reduce the possibility of fire jumping from a tree to your building quickly. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and we even, we have several large trees around our house and we had an arborist um, limb them so that they weren't so thick, so that the <coughs> in the wind, it wouldn't sail as catch so much of the wind and you would have better chance of it staying <laughs> and not. Yeah, that's not a problem right now. We've seen all over the island, there are trees and power poles down, even trees with green leaves on catch quite, as Wendy was saying, they become a sail mm -hmm. and they catch quite a bit of wind. Any tree mm -hmm. that's heavily involved with ivy is going to make a, have a sail problem. And when the ground is so wet and we get these strong southerly winds, especially, the, um, the trees and shrubs can destabilize and that's when we get, that's when you get a lot of trees coming down. So reducing the, the weight, but a good arborist will do that carefully and thoughtfully and not mm. just kind of whack a bunch of right. limbs off. It's really important that you use a certified arborist. Hey, Anne, I had a couple of questions on, I haven't, I, I guess I've accumulated some pretty substantial pots, pot, potted, uh, plants, a lot of perennials in there, um, begonias, and they were so beautiful this summer. And, you know, because they're so different, I've got ferns, hellebores, begonias. Can I take all of those out and do something with them to winterize them? You know, because they're kind of overgrown at this point. So I need to change things up. And also I'd like to, you know, in the past, I've kind of like, yeah, if it survives, that's great but I'd like to try to um, keep them going. Not, you know, I'm good with the, um, you know, this solid perennials, but they're so big now. So is it too late for me to move those around? No, not at all. And, and you can either put each thing into an individual pot. It sounds like they're big enough that they could make a nice centerpiece for an individual pot. If you've got room in the ground, you can put any of them in a, like the hellebores and ferns would like to be in a more shady environment, of course. Yep. Begonia is also like, um, they don't mind morning sun, but they do not really like afternoon sun. And also a lot of the begonias are semi-hardy so that in a mild winter they'll come through, but in a hard winter they won't. So you might want to pot them up and bring them indoors if you really, really love them, or put them in a yeah. covered garage where they can mm -hmm. die back but be, and go dormant, but not freeze. Um, can I just do that in just regular potting soil, or do I have to get fussy about it? Can oh, no, I just... regular potting soil is good, but you want to put at least a few inches of crocked pots or broken pots or something at mm -hmm. the base. One of the biggest problems in the winter is pots, if they are outdoors, especially with so much rain, the air holes, the drain holes start to clog up. And so you can tip it on its side and ram something like, I use a heavy screwdriver to really make holes in the, in the soil and stir it around and make sure those drainage holes are open and then put the pot up on two or three bricks so that there's mm -hmm. air exchange and it can drain properly. Because otherwise you can get waterlogged and then you'll get root rots and then the plants rot and die. When the Got pot it. fills up with water, that's a sign that you don't have. <laughs> if you have water pots, those beautiful pots that are often used as water reflecting pools or even some of the deeper bird baths, you wanna empty those and put them either upside down or store them in a garage, again, a covered place. Terracotta pots can flake in freezing weather. Great. Especially if they're full. They flake off, like the mm -hmm. outer part will just flake and, and just start to deteriorate if they haven't been really high fired. Most of them have not. Mm -hmm. So they're a little more vulnerable. They're less vulnerable if they're planted um, because the plants in soil help buffer the freezing temperature. But it's still something to think about if, you know, just plain terracotta pots, not very hardy in a wet, cold winter. Okay. I've got some dahlias too in pots and in the ground. And I think I'll just, you know, cross my fingers. It's got to be awfully wet out there right now. But um, yeah, I just don't know that I've got the energy and the effort to dig them up and baby oh, them. You know, most 
a lot of dahlias are much hardier now. They've been bred to be hardier over the last 10, 15 years. And again, those, if you have blowdown, you've got some nice loose side branches. You can trim those and pile a heap of those on top of those uh, of the places where the dahlias are buried, even over your pots. But again, those I would put in the garage, maybe up on bricks to make sure they get good air circulation. So if you can have a place like that, a shed or a garage, a co okay. carport, covered place where they're not out in the weather, um, they can go dormant peacefully. Same with fuchsia, hardy fuchsia baskets and things like yeah. that. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. One other real quick question, and that is that I, do you have a recommendation? It, I just don't know the different, I've, I've found lists online for natives that are good for shoreline, mm -hmm. you know, but I have no idea what those names mean, and it's confusing to try to find out what they look like, you know, and, but, but I've got a very dry area that I'd like to be low maintenance, but, but pretty, that's right near the water. And I'm wondering, do you have anything off the top of your head that, that doesn't need a lot of, you know, that would be dry, full sun, um, tolerant? Yeah, that's and good that's, for the water, you, you know? If you go to, again, the Department of Natural Resources website, they have, handouts, which you used to be able to pick up at City Hall, I don't know, you might, you know, call City Hall and ask if they have them, so could somebody bring out one for you, um, but there are hand, handbooks about stabilizing slopes with native plants, and there right. are similar ones about, you know, native plants for dry situations, and they're very, they're like a, maybe a 40-page booklet, each page tells you about the plant and so forth, and it has the Latin name and the common name, and you can figure out pretty well. And yeah. on the website, I think there's illustrated with uh, actually pictures too. And, yeah. and all those, those are really good things to know because a lot of people are planting stuff on their slopes that are not good stabilizers. And when we've been seeing mudslides over the last few, few decades, you'll see these big slides and back up on the hill, there's the sword fern still there. Mm -hmm. The salam mm -hmm. is still there, but all the ivies down at the mm -hmm. bottom of the hill, right? Mm -hmm. It's like there, it's a lot of the native plants that you see on the shoreline and bluff are going to be the, the right ones to put back mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a pretty, it's a low bank. We've got a uh, area near a bulkhead, but it's pretty natural. And I just wanted, and it, and it, there's a slice and actually it's our neighbors that look right at it. So I was trying to find something. I don't know if it's thinking Rosa Ragosa, those Rosa Ragosa, those wild roses. I think those might be native. So it's trying to find something that's kind of decorative. So it looks nice, but you know, it's all. And I did look online, but for whatever reason, it was just confusing. I didn't see the visual. So I've got to find a resource that shows me more, you know, well, okay, the, the uh, Rosa rugosa is native to Japan, but uh, it is a peach rose, and it is a pretty good alternative, and they are quite showy, and they have great big hips, and birds mm -hmm. around here have totally figured out, it's birds and squirrels know very well what those are, and they will eat them. Um, our native roses would be Pisacarpa or nut, nutka, nutka Rose, um, and if you look at any of the nurseries, Bainbridge Gardens, Bay Hay, they definitely have native sections with a lot of these things in them. And you Probably can look, but it's it. true that a gallon pot doesn't look like a four foot plant, but it does give you a sense of it. I think mm -hmm. if you go to um, Bloedel as well, you'll see areas where there's a lot of native plants that are mature and you can look at what they look like there. Yeah, that's great. Good advice. Um, but again, there's, um, there are lots and lots of options. If it's a steep section, you can actually get this jute mesh that, um, with squares about four by four inches. And it, you can, you fasten it to the slope with like the kind of uh, big staples, ground staples that are uh. like six inches long. And then they can plant in the pockets and each pocket you scoop out to make a little reservoir. So that instead of planting at this angle, you're kind of making a little pocket. Right? Uh, uh -huh. and then you can yeah. plant into that pocket and that plant will establish and then slowly you'll get your plant. Okay. And remember, if you start at the top, plants will sow themselves down. Go down. Yeah. yeah. And okay. compost does not wash away as quickly as soil. So if you can also put compost down and you can put down flaked um, bedding straw and then put the mesh over that and that will, or lots of leaves 
put the mesh over that, that will hold it in place and you'll get much less erosion. Okay, thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Megan, you said you had another question. And I'm sorry, I always forget that I have two, but um, the other is um, we have a large lawn and I want to, I'm the mower of that. Um, I'd like to find some ground cover and trees to make it more of a natural setting and not have to mow. Do you have any recommendations? Well, yeah, I always think about making sort of a pollinator meadow. And again, we just talked about not putting trees too close to your house. So I put the trees and use smaller ones closer to the edge of the woodlands that are around you, because I know you're near woods, right? Mm -hmm. And sort of remember, think about that golden bowl so that your home area doesn't have a lot of shrubs and trees around it. But outside that, that space, you can start building up. But if, it's, if you've put plants into your, uh, to start replacing your lawn, I'd recommend that you start on the outer edge and do a strip. Every year you can make it a little bigger. But trying to take on Kansas is a lot and it's too hard and then you'll get weeds and problems and it just turns into a mess. But if you do a planting strip, maybe it's three feet wide um, and you start there and you put in, maybe you wanna put in some small uh, native crab apple or native um, mock orange, some, uh, some salmon berry maybe, if you, you, know, you wanna to try to um, help birds and, and all the different kinds of pollinators, you might think about those native plants that have seeds and nuts and berries and fruit, right? Um, those are good ones. And again, all the local nurseries have these plants and you can get a gallon size. You don't need to invest in huge plants. They'll grow up just fine. And again, this is a wonderful time to start doing that. But if you just strip off the lawn and the way to do that is to actually cut it with a sharp shovel or an edging tool and you can take a strip about three feet wide and cut the edges of it and then one person rolls it up and the other person takes the edging tool and slices the roots off the grass and you make a big jelly roll and take that and then you can stack those pieces so you do green side down and then earth to earth and then green side to green side earth to earth and you stack them up end with earth on top cover the whole thing with a tarp and in a couple years it'll just be beautiful compost all the way down wow that's a way to re repurpose that turf that you're taking up, which is usually in pretty crappy shape anyway, because around here, lawn is not the, what happens. <laughs> we have a lot of moss. Yeah. So you might not worry so much about the moss. And if you don't have much grass and it's actually kind of weedy, you just start pulling out the grass and planting a fern, pulling out the grass and planting uh, a small huckleberry, pulling out the grass and planting some snowberry, um, right? And, and then gradually you'll get a mossy carpet with these native plants in it. So well, snow, can, snowberry is a good ground cover? Does well, that no, spread? but it, if you're against the woods, you're starting with a, because you're going to, you're going to come down from a maybe 200 foot tree. You need it a little, you can't just go down to a ground cover. It looks kind of silly. So mm -hmm. you need a, a ladder to take your eye back down. So you're going to have some small trees and small shrubs. And when I say small trees, I mean 15 to 18 feet, and then down to shrubs that are, say, six to eight feet, like elderberries. Um, some of the huckleberries get pretty big like that. But always thinking about who are you planting for? If you're planting for um, wildlife, then you wanna make, there's some wonderful books by, oh gosh, what's his name, Russell? Oh, I'll get it. Anyway, it's called um, Planting for Wildlife in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> and, <laughs> They're great books. Do you have a, can you look for that? It's uh, University of Washington Press, I think. And he had two. One was um, controlling plant and critters in the garden, but one is really specifically planting for, um, for critters, it, wildlife in the Pacific Northwest. And they're great books. Russell Link. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. Russell Link. Link. L-I-N-K? Yeah. L-I-N-K. Your link to the future, Megan. That's right. And those are fabulous books. And Wendy, they have pictures. <laughs> so they'll be good for you too. <laughs> That's and, great. Thank you. I'm looking it up. Great. And Wendy, this is Francine. Um, yes. I've been on the island for about eight years. And um, over those eight years, I've been purchasing a lot of natives from the Kitsap Conservatory, 
is that conservatory district? Am I conservation saying that? Conservation district. Conservation district, yes. And I mean, they have wonderful natives, very inexpensive. Um, I usually overbuy <laughs> because I get too excited and um, I've potted a lot of them up, but I, you know, eventually they'll, they grow great. My little um, garden area that I have set aside for those types of plants. And then I can get them planted as, you know, as I have the time in the area and what have you, but they're a great resource. I don't know how you feel about that, Anne, but I found the plants that they have have been pretty good. Yeah, they are good. You usually get bundles of 10, yeah. which for a lot of people is kind of daunting. Um, and yeah. they're often fairly small. They're either whips, which just means one little stem with some roots or um, really fairly small uh, plants. And so they often need a, a good year of care, potting up or um, being put in a place where they can be, um, they won't right. get over by some thuggy plant. Uh, but if, if you have the time and energy to do that, they're great. They're very inexpensive. And that is right, the conservation district has that sale every year. I believe that the sale itself is in March and yes. you pick your plants at the fair fairgrounds, kits at fairgrounds. Um, right. But the ordering is in February. Right. Um, and you January or February. Fine. Sorry. I, I mentioned that you can order right online and um, you just head down on your assigned day and pick them up. And it, I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah, and you can sign up on the website, the Conservation District website, to get the notifications either in paper or um, by email. So that, yeah, if you're looking for volume, that's a really good resource, definitely. So, Anne? Yes, Christina. So I don't have a question, but I want to share with you my horror story of last week. So I went and I got all my leaves. We're losing you, Christina. Oh, sorry. Uh, Wait. Oops. Can you hear me? Now we can. We lost you for a minute okay. there. Okay. So I picked up all the leaves from my trees, and I went ahead and I put it on my little garden spot, going, okay, that's going to be the mulch. I made certain that any ground cover was not covered over, and I had it all insulated, and then the rain's come, and I'm just so happy. The landscapers to my landlord came at, last week, and not only did they use a leaf blower to blow off all of the leaves off my little garden pot, they walked on the garden pot, so they crunched everything down with their big heavy boots. I I just cried. I just, <laughs> we just cried. It was a nightmare. I can't believe they did that. Oh, I'm so sorry, but yeah, that is a problem with a, especially the mow and blow crews, they are clueless and they're taught to do certain things in a certain way. And it's all about the appearance of tidiness and nothing whatsoever about, about ecological benefits to soil or anything else. And so, yeah, it's um, one way you can do that. I've seen some people do that pretty successfully is put four uh, wands, even bamboo sticks or something like that at the corners of the bed and then string around it just a simple like and then put netting over the whole thing um and that will clue them in at least that they're not supposed to be doing anything there okay. but yeah you have to be really obvious um and and you might even have to put up a sign that says do not blow <laughs> <laughs> no blow zone right just stay no out of here. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's difficult because you're not there right and right you know, I've put up signs in, in laminated and they, you know, if they're wet, sometimes they can't read them again, but, but do anything you can to make it really obvious that this is a, a deliberate thing. And again, a piece of um, deer netting over the leaves with some mm -hmm. large stones will help okay. make it very obvious, hopefully. And there's still time to heal that again, but I don't know where okay. you're gonna get your leaves now. <laughs> But flaked straw would also be as, as something okay. you can use. Bedding straw, not um, the hay for horses, right? Because that'll all sprout and you don't want to do that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'm really sorry. Anybody else? One thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is bulbs, that this is a time to start planting those indoor bulbs. And if you have hyacinths or anything else, you can get these hyacinth glasses like this um, and 
they sit, the bulb will sit nicely right in the neck of it. You keep this almost full of water, but with a little bit of air and the roots will completely fill the vase. And so you don't want them in direct sunlight because that can actually scorch the roots, but they get, they're fine on a windowsill. They need nice and in bright indirect light. And then you'll get your flowering plant, which you can, after it's finished blooming, you can actually plant them outside. They might not bloom the following year because they didn't get any nutrients from the water or not enough to matter. Uh, they will draw some from the air. They can pull down um, atmospheric nitrogen from the air and capture that, but it isn't really enough to usually put up a good bloom spike the second year, but then they'll recover after that. Uh, but it's a fun way to have a little brightness in the house. And if you're doing um, those narcissus, which people love to give and get, but they get beautiful and they're fragrant and then the leaves start falling and then they turn yellow and they're funky and they're a big mess and you try to hold them up and they make a giant. Well, one good way to deal with that is to plant them in a tall, narrow vase like this. Or if somebody gives you a little pot of them, find a tall, narrow vase you can drop the whole pot into. Stuff a little sphagnum moss or something around the edge of it so you don't necessarily see the pot. It will look beautiful. They'll stay upright and they'll look a lot more attractive for the whole holiday season. <laughs> it took me years to figure that out. <laughs> I, I love those um, narcissus, and I I plant them a lot this year, this time of year, and uh -huh. I, that's perfect. That's wonderful because I've always got shallow bowls, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's pretty for ten minutes, and then after that, it's right. really not, and it's really hard. You I mean you can sort of thread in barbecue sticks and things like that yeah. and start roping them together, but then it looks like you know sacrificial victims. <laughs> and that's not really the look you want. So the tall vase thing is, and then you can have a bunch of those and use them other times of year with candles in them and things like that. I mean, they'll be very useful. And I get them at yard sales. And then there's there's nothing we can do with those after they bloom, right? Uh, They're, are they all spent? Uh, that's what I've heard. And so I've just... If you plant them, into but... soil, no, they're not all spent, but they are not hardy. So what they need is to dry out in their soil um, and go put them under the garden bench or something like that. For, so they're mm -hmm. on the opposite schedule for the to the things that we're putting mm -hmm. away now. So they'll be out in the household now. And then as they die off, you just pinch off the spent blossom because they'll start to try to make seed. You'll get the swollen. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. And and so what you want to do is pinch off the flower heads that have faded, leave the stems, let them dry, let the whole thing dry naturally, which is very unattractive. So if you can put that out of sight somewhere, and they can go in the garage now, which would be, you know, January, February, and then they sit there all summer, and then you bring them out, dust them off in September, October, um, give them fresh soil. And one way to do that is if you're going to do that and you plan to carry them over, feed them every couple of weeks with a half strength fertilizer, like miracle Grow or something like that. Um, house in plants September, like, when you bring them back out. Yeah, but even September. right now, like you plant them, give them a couple oh. weeks and give them uh -huh. a half strength fertilizer every couple of weeks. And that way you are supplying nutrients that it can store. Oh, and, yeah. right. But don't, yeah. start, so don't start until you see the buds emerge. Okay. Because the fertilizer will increase the foliage. Yeah. But you don't want to produce foliage at the expense of flowers. But the flowers are already in there. But you want to wait till the flowers are up so that it has hormonally, it's concentrating on the bud and blossom. And then when you start feeding it, it will start promoting extra foliage. And that yeah. extra nutrients and the foliage stores the nutrients, which as they ripen off, they'll put back into the storage bowl. That's why they're right. Spent, right? Yeah. And, and then, then you would the just force them again. So you bring them in, you fertilize them, and then you and then you might have well, you bring them in, you don't fertilize them in the fall. You just clean off the old soil. Oh, oh, okay. You know, just because they'll be dry. Get them bulk. started. Put and, them in fresh soil. Start the yeah. cycle again. As the flower was, starts to emerge, then you can start feeding again every couple Yeah, of weeks. okay. But you can cool. keep going. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Similar with poinsettias or no? No. Poinsettias are tricky. They're different. They're daylight um, sensitive. So the, and what we think are petals are really uh, sort of modified foliage. And they only change color when they receive a certain amount of darkness and a certain amount of daylight 
and it has very specific timing. And so the greenhouses they're raised in are artificially darkened for half the, you know, I can't remember the whole schedule now, but I of course spent years doing this in a closet because geek, 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 right? You have to try it. But anyway, um, poinsettias are not hardy and they do get in their native land, they're eight, 10, 15 feet high. They're a big plant. So what we're dealing with is these little um, cuttings really, and they're not truly worth saving. Just unless saying. you're, unless you're a uh, uh, geek, a green yeah, if, geek. I mean, it's fun to do stuff like that once or twice. And then you realize the amount of time it takes because they have to have artificial light of certain strength and you have to, the timer has to be exactly right. And if you forget, um, it's toast anyway, and for two two ninety nine or five ninety nine or whatever they are, it's not worth it, in my opinion. But if you want to do it, I'll look it up for you. <laughs> no, no, we're good. Now amaryllis are another story because they they can be grown as perennials, and they there's your wide shallow bowl, Wendy. They will do really well in a wide shallow bowl, but they don't like their bulb to be covered all the way. So with an amaryllis bulb. You don't want to plant it like this. I would plant it so that the tip barely came out of the soil. So the soil would be covering most of this, right? This much. But if this was an amaryllis, I would have the top third of the bulb exposed. And that's what they prefer. So in a wide shallow bowl, if you put your amaryllis um, and don't just use the cocoa fiber that comes with it, you use really nice potting soil mixed with some of that cocoa fiber and then grow it like a house plant. And again, start once the, the flower bulb emerges, start fertilizing every couple of weeks with a half strength and grow it like a house plant. So then after that, you fertilize once a month through the year. Um, and it will, sometimes the bloom gets off. Like I have had them bloom in August or September, just crazy, but, but they'll get, they'll find their cycle and just start blooming. They, most of them are not hardy outside because of the wet as much as anything, but. Um, and does the green, so they stay green. They yeah, they stay green and the strappy foliage is still there. Again, you pinch off the spent blossoms, let mm -hmm. that stalk die down, pull mm -hmm. it gently off and put it in the mm -hmm. compost. And then the rest of it, you grow them green. And what will happen is they start creating offsets. They're called pups. And so you'll get baby bulbs at yeah. the side. And I used to grow some of the smaller species and you could get like a little thicket of them. They're really amazing mm -hmm. um, in a wide shallow bowl. And they'll start blooming in a couple of years and be bloom sized if you treat them like a house plant. Um, so that's what I'll do with my wide shallow bowls now, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to check back because, you know, on the Narcissus, I would use gravel, um, and, you know, to, when I forced those previously rather than soil, um, and I wouldn't cover the bulb and I would just water it so the roots would get to it. Um, but in this situation, a soil is better covering the bowl. bowl well, yeah, I mean, it, gravel doesn't, doesn't matter. Have, uh, gravel doesn't have available nutrients. A. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So you want it's soil no. because we're keeping the bulb alive. Right. So think about right. the words. Are you forcing or are you growing? Yeah, right, 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 right. Forcing is yeah. coercive and it doesn't work with the natural process very well. I mean, the, the flower's in there already, right? It's, sure, you know, right. It's possible to kill it before it blooms, but it's not easy. Um, but if you grow it like a house plant, then yeah. what you're trying to do is give it a decent soil base, right? Good drainage. Right. It has to have a pot with drainage instead of a solid pot with no drainage. Right. It's a whole different, you're growing it like a house plant. Right, right, right. Which so, then, go, then my tall base doesn't quite work because there's no drain, drainage in that. Well, if you put I'll it in a think pot, on this. if you put it in a little, if it's in a small pot that drops into your tall base and you pack the sphagnum oh, yeah, sure. on the edge of it, that works. <laughs> okay. You are but, so smart. You are just so dang smart. <laughs> you know, many years ill spent in weird experiments. <laughs> oh, of course. It makes but sense. the thing is, you know, they're also not that expensive either. So if you know. No, I know, but I like this idea of not just, I, yeah, the idea, if I like it every summer, I mean, every season, every holiday, it would be kind of fun to see if we could do that. Yeah, Keep it is going. fun. And yeah. like the amaryllis are wonderful. They make beautiful house yes. plants and they can last for years. And when they start pupping, it's really exciting. It's yeah. like you've given birth to a beautiful little <laughs> It's a little flower. It's a baby family, family right? 
There are some species amaryllis that are kind of short. They don't get much more than a 12 inches high. And those are adorable in a, in a family base. And there again, you can plant them in, in a plant with drainage holes and then drop that into one of your beautiful pots and use sphagnum moss or something as a covering. Um, and so they will have their drainage they need and they will be able to live on and on, and, but they won't, um, they, it will look more attractive. And when I do that, I usually put a little bit of gravel in the bottom of the beautiful bowl and then put the planted bowl on top of, a planted pot on top of that and then put the moss on top, right? Yep. Air and drainage. I have gotten so many notes. I've got to, <laughs> I've got to rewrite so I can <laughs> keep track of this. I've got to sign off now, but really appreciate this. Reed, thanks for all your good work making this happen. And oh, you're just a treasure. It's nice, really to, nice to see you, Wendy. And yes. you'll need to you'll need to watch the video because I'm going to now ask Ann to talk a little bit about the teas that she talked about in her blog this week. Oh, yeah. So you'll have to watch okay. it on YouTube oh. after we post it, which you can no, always do if you happen to miss Anne's talk That's online, right. come to youtube.com slash BI Senior Center. Hey, Lexi, and I just be willing to go to my room just a second. Sure. I just want to say, Reed, that was a tease about the tease. So. That's right. It's a tease sure. tease. Tease, and we'll get right, to it in just a minute. Guys. It looks it looks like uh, Anne's going to get something maybe from okay. her room about the teas. And while she's doing that, I'll tell you that you can just search for Green Gardening with uh, Anne Lovejoy, and you'll find her blog, which is a delightful regular irregular column. <laughs> it's regular. It's every it's every Monday, but it's irregular in that it's all over the map about what it is. And my beautiful assistant is just bringing to me. <laughs> oh, actually, that's the wrong one, but. <laughs> oh well this is fine we'll use this great perfect thank you thank you lexi i know there was one with three big bags but that's okay i don't know what i did with it. so what i've been doing i'm doing a class for the art museum on saturday on making herbal crafts and it will be things like um bath salts and herbal teas and so forth. But I was also blogging about herbal teas because it's something I do really often. And what I like to do is take my little teapot out into the garden and start pinching. And I'll put, oh, a little rosemary. I'll put some rose petals. I'll put some calendula petals. I'll put some lemon thyme and a bunch of chamomile, for instance. Um, and all those things. And then pour almost boiling water. You want it to be not quite boiling where you start to see the bubbles at the bottom, but it isn't a rolling boil because the, by the time it has a rolling boil, all the oxygen and much of the oxygen has been lost. So you want it to still have a little light and air in there. So um, pour that over your herbs and let them steep, depending on your personal taste, somewhere between five and 15 minutes. You can use things like mashed rose hips. Um, you can use, peach slices mixed in there. You can use grated orange rind or lemon rind or lime rind if they're organic fruit. Um, you can add a squeeze of any of those juices um, and then strain it, whatever your mixture turns out to be, and put a little honey in. And they're just delicious. I like, one of my favorite is spearmint, which is a little mellower than peppermint. Peppermint's the zingier, but- um, Steve Parsons. Excuse me. So peppermint is zippier, but spearmint is mellower. And you, depending on your mood, you might want a mixture or either one. Um, but those with a little bit of chopped licorice root. Um, now, some people have a trouble with licorice, but I really love it because it's very soothing and calming and it's a natural sweetener too. And so those combination of those two things is just fragrant and beautiful and very um, both soothing and mildly energizing at the same time. I'll beat that. Right. So for me, one of the fun things about a garden is that you can do exactly that. Roam around in it, putter, find something that smells really good. Now, if you're not exactly sure what you're growing and they're not culinary herbs, you might want to double check before you start eating stuff that isn't like, oh, that's pretty. I should try some of that. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe no. Some plants in the garden are quite toxic, but anything in the herb families, the flowers are not. And so like pineapple sage, um, I mostly grow for the hummingbirds, but the, the foliage of that has almost like a fruit salad flavor. And you can drop some of those in your teapot and make a really spicy, interesting blend with a little cinnamon. 
say, and some orange peel. Um, but, and so experimenting freely with the foliage and flowers of any of the uh, culinary herbs, the common culinary herbs that you use for cooking, that will work really well. There and are can you also use those flowers yeah, in uh, salads or that kind of oh, thing? Oh yeah, definitely. There's a lot of edible flowers. I do want to say though that some traditional herbs, medicinal herbs like uh, rue, are incredibly bitter and nasty and you don't want to eat those or, or um, some of the, uh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm blocking them. Just some of the herbs that are used more for things like chasing away moths, they're not the kind of herbs you want to put in your teapot, okay? Artemisia, that's what I was trying to think of. Um, wormwood, it's called. Does wormwood sound yummy? No, it isn't. So you want to make sure it's things like mint, you know, a little sage. Sage, a little is good. A lot can be a kind of tough. Um, so start with smaller amounts. I usually begin with chamomile, and I buy chamomile, dried chamomile by the pound, um, because, and willows naturally has a lot of um, bulk herbs if you want to play around and start trying some of these things yourself. It's not exactly the great perfect time to go harvest herbs in the garden, except for things like, I still got plenty of mint, I've got oregano, I've got lemon balm, I've got thyme. Um, the pineapple sage is still in full flower and the hummingbirds are all over it every day. So because our years are mild, there are some of these herbs that you can be harvesting really all year round. And uh, when you think about edible flowers, read, you know, flowers of things like chives, um, they're in the onion family, but the flowers don't taste like onions and they smell fragrant, like they're in the lily family. So they'll have a sweet scent and you can put those in your salad too, um, right? But like calendula petals are edible, um, Johnny Jump Ups, pansies, calendula. I still got those calendulas going, that's for sure. Yeah, you will have them forever. And you probably still have some... Um, what else did we plant for that wedding for you? Nasturtiums, right? Yeah, yep. so nasturtium leaves have a sort of peppery flavor and there you can roll things up and make teeny wraps out of them like shrimp and some greens and stuff and a little bit of fish sauce or something. Um, and the nasturtium flowers can go in, in salads or be a beautiful garnish for soup or salad or anything like that too. Yes, I've known about that. Um, nasturtiums and cosmos, not so much. I don't think so. I'm, it doesn't, and I'd have to look it up, but I think okay. not. And that's the thing, you know, when something looks like, oh, that might be good, always check. And there are great toxicology sites. So if you just put in our cosmos toxic, boom, you'll get an answer, yes, no, maybe. Like Narcissus, for instance, are quite toxic. Um, and even those little baby ones. I remember <laughs> I got a frantic phone call from some kids that had decorated a birthday cake for their friend with the baby Narcissus and he was eating them. And I was like, oh, well, they're toxic, but you'd have to eat a fair number. And he's there like, he has. So <laughs> they ended up <laughs> to, the, to get his stomach pumped. But um, most... Well, the, the internet, at least, uh, at least gardening, uh, this gardening website says that cosmos flowers are not poisonous. They're a lovely non-toxic flower. Okay. But nasturtium, pansy, violet, johnny jump up, calendula, chive, and sage might be a better choice. Yeah, definitely. If it's just non-toxic, that doesn't say anything about is it yummy. <laughs> exactly. Right? And there's a reason. It's kind of interesting. I found an old copy of, I think it was Fanny Farmer cookbook from like 1880s or 90s or something like that at one of the um, historic society displays and there was a recipe in there it was there's a whole little section about edible flowers for decorating cakes so back in the day that's what people use because it's what they had it was pre-edible glitter right <laughs> imagine, imagine imagine that but you can make really fun glitter with i mean not glitter but you can take shred petals like rose petals calendula petals um violet petals if you still have, and then scatter those over the top of a cake and it looks really, really pretty. Just saying. That's wonderful. Yeah. But the, um, there are better websites than just looking it up sort of vaguely. Yes. There's, there's state ones and national ones on toxicology, on toxic food and plants. Always good to check before you get excited and start stuffing those calla lilies with shrimp salad because those really are pretty toxic. Uh, unlike a daylily, which you could stuff indefinitely. The other thing is if you use flowers, in, in edible flowers, you might want to pull the stamens out because some people are allergic to pollen. And that also gives you more of a pocket to put things in. Um, 
but I try to pull, I remove the stamens from all those things so that they don't shed pollen all over the place or trigger somebody's allergies. Have a lovely Thank winter. <laughs> we really appreciate you doing this. Yeah. I always enjoy it so much. So bring your questions and then I don't have to think of anything myself. <laughs>